Today we're going to check out a keyboard that is definitely deep within the mechanical keyboard community. It's such a prominent keyboard and is owned by quite a lot of people. It's distinctive in its look and design and this is of course the Happy Hacking Keyboard which is a great name by the way or HHKB with this one being the Professional 2 from PFU. A huge thanks to Danny for loaning this keyboard to me and giving me the opportunity to review it. And we also have a wrist rest and a cover which are from Bird Electron from Japan. Opening out the box we have the mini USB cable, the keyboard itself, some paperwork and two stickers with a 20th anniversary one as well. And here it is, and this thing is light, but it doesn't feel necessarily cheap, and it has minimal flex because of that quite bulky design of the enclosure. It only comes at just over 500 grams because of its complete plastic construction, and for the price it comes at, many for sure will be left feeling short, especially if you didn't do your research, and that's an absolutely fair point. Even though it is light, it's not too far off standard 60% boards with steel plates, but the fact that it's just all plastic may not make sense from a price standpoint, but funnily enough, it's also one of the big features of the keyboard. The HHKB is a 60% keyboard, meaning that it's approximately 60% of a full-size keyboard, so it's like the Poker keyboards and is the same size as this AND Pro. However, we have some open spaces on the two bottom corners, which for sure will perplex many people as to why that is. And this is what gives the HHKB its iconic look, which is finished off by the classic branding. Usually I dislike clear branding, but when it's expensive, it just seems to be more acceptable, and that's just how it is. And that's what makes it beautiful. It's a very simple rectangular design with a slim chin and a thicker header. The keycaps are an elegant white and grey with perfectly clean black legends. However, this is also available in a stealthy black version. If we look at the side profile, we can see it has quite a bit of natural elevation with a slightly curved top edge, and it's just a solid flat side which I like. On the rear we have two USB-A ports and our mini USB port to connect the keyboard to the device. And while you may be happy to see a USB hub, these are low powered. So I can't use my USB 3 drives as Windows will say it doesn't have enough power. The only use I've gotten out of them is plugging in my wireless dongle for my mouse. This is especially useful for me since I do work with my tablet sometimes for testing, and since the keyboard does populate the only USB output, I can't normally use my mouse, so it's somewhat useful for me, but for others, completely not. This is one of the reasons amongst others that people get an alternative controller from Hasu, which can allow for full programmability and Bluetooth capabilities. And then next to those, we have our dip switch door, we have six dip switches that change a few things on the keyboard. If we look at the bottom of the keyboard, there's actually a table that tells you what each switch does. I only changed one switch, which is the third one, and that allows backspace to be the delete key. So by default, the backspace is on a function layer, meaning that you have to press function and delete, so that was just an automatic change for me. And on the bottom, we have two rubber feet, which is again disappointing at this price point, as it does slide around. And there are two flip-up feet on each side for different angles, but again, they're not rubber tipped. This is my first extended period with a HHKB, so while I have used 60% keyboards in the past, this layout is a new experience for me. And this layout is absolutely adored by many, but for what I do and how I use my keyboard, it's not really for me. And by moving the control key to where caps lock was, it's been a nice change having it much more easy to reach with my pinky. By default, the backspace key is on a secondary layer, which yeah, is impossible, so as said before, I flicked the third dip switch to have it on the delete key. This is also in a different position, being one row lower than normal, but I got used to it within minutes, and this is something I actually really liked because when I went back to a normal layout when testing other keyboards, I constantly hit the slash key. Because naturally the backspace is that touch too far to reach without moving your hand and wrist, and with it being lower, I can actually reach it with my pinky. Other than that, it's just typical 60% keyboard use. We have the arrow keys on a secondary layer, but are in a diamond shape. Personally, I do prefer my dedicated arrow keys, because I use them a lot. The function row is at the top on the secondary layer as per usual, and we have the nav cluster scattered around the right side of the keyboard, which is also in close proximity to the function key. 
Because of the smaller bottom row, our function key is on the right, creating a shorter shift key. I do like this setup and I have no issues with it. And there's no doubt that it's not the most space efficient bottom row because why not just have whatever keys there, like anything. But once the control key is moved, I just forgot about those spaces. It just didn't matter anymore and sure there can be something else there, but it would just be like a specialized key that you may not even use. And finally, we have some media control keys on ASDF and it's good to see that they included the option and command symbols for Apple users. So for work, it's not my thing. I like dedicated caps lock, I like my dedicated arrow keys and even some of the nav keys, but it's still absolutely usable. But for casual use like just typing and browsing the internet, I found it easy to use and quickly got used to its little quirks. People often say that after using this layout for a while, they can't go back to normal. And perhaps if I gave this more of a chance, that could be the case for casual use. But for many of you out there, this is quite foreign and will require that bit of time and effort to get used to. I know people already struggle with the idea of going less than a 10 keyless, so it may be daunting to some. The other big feature and part of the high price is that it uses Topra key switches. I've gone in depth about these switches in previous videos, but basically these are not mechanical, but are using rubber domes or cups. However, these are much better than the regular run of the mill membrane keyboard. So we have the keycap which is on top of the plunger, which we push down just like a normal switch, and that depresses the rubber cup which has a conical spring inside. And then that interacts with a capacitive sensor on the PCB which creates the actuation. This creates a different experience in comparison to a typical mechanical switch. It's much like a rubber dome where the tactile bump isn't sharp and distinct and is towards the top instead of the middle. These ones in particular are 45 gram domes, so they're not overly heavy and have decent tactile feedback. A normal rubber dome keyboard that you find anywhere tend to be heavier at like 50, 60, 70 and higher, but will be mushier. And as these have turbo stems, normal MX style keycaps cannot be put on there unless you replace the sliders. And this is where the plastic construction, more specifically the plastic plate, comes into play. The other Topra boards like the Real Forces and the Leopold FC 660C have steel mounting plates and this impacts on the typing experience on how it feels and sounds. Without thinking, I let my Real Force while I had his HHKB so I can't do a direct comparison but basically the plastic case kind of softens the experience in a way. However, my experience out of the box wasn't great. Most of my experience has been with a Real Force which I felt was very smooth and worked perfectly but these did not feel that smooth, however this may change over time as you wear it in. And then there was also this weird issue with some keys having some odd sharpish sound and was something to do with the spring and that's just unacceptable. And then the spacebar was just rattly. My real force spacebar is just the most perfect spacebar I have ever used. But this rattled and was loud which was disappointing, but to be clear this is for this specific unit, I tried others that are fine but I guess there's potential for this to happen. So let's just open it up and have a look, it's super easy with just a couple of exposed Phillips head screws. Here's the plastic bottom shell and this also houses the controller and other bits including those very limited USB ports. The great thing about this as said before is that you can purchase an alternative Hasu controller which will give you full programmability and Bluetooth capabilities. 
And other than that, it's very simple. There's no ribbing or reinforcement anywhere. And because of this, it of course flexes on its own. Here's the top bit and everything is held together because the sliders are on one side and the keycaps on the other. And as you can see, basically all these black bits do is push down on the rubber domes. And then here is what makes this thing expensive. We have the PCB and the domes. These rubber domes can be taken off and replaced with ease. They aren't fixed to anything, but just stay in place when everything is put together. And then under the domes are the conical springs. And these do not determine the weight of the key switch, like on the MX style switches. Rather, it's the dome itself that does that. And here's the issue I was having with that annoying sound. And I really wasn't sure what to do. And I just moved stuff around and put it back together and it helped somewhat. And let's also quickly open the other things. We have this wooden wrist rest and then a clear acrylic cover specifically made for this keyboard. The wrist rest comes with two sets of flat rubber feet which are of differing heights. Since it's not mine, I didn't stick them on. Without the rubber feet, the wrist rest is dead flat with no angle of elevation. I think this is the walnut color and it looks quite nice. It's pretty standard with a smooth satin finish but you can feel the grains. On the bottom we do have their branding and also this scoop and yeah, it does what it's supposed to do in reducing the angle in your wrists. Now to the keyboard cover or roof as they call it. This comes with some self adhesive foam to both protect the keyboard and also prevents it from sliding. I don't know how exactly this is supposed to be. There's four strips but for now I just put one on each side and that does the job. And this thing is just stunning. I've made my own acrylic covers before, but they were just bent and aren't closed like this. On this one, we have the clear acrylic, but then the black pieces on the ends to close it off. The acrylic is about three millimeters thick, but when I opened it, one corner had a slight crack in it, which is disappointing. But this looks absolutely amazing, but most importantly, it keeps all the dust out. So overall, it's a mixed bag. The keyboard has such a stigma that even though I haven't had much time with it before, what people value is already in my head, and that's a good thing because I probably wouldn't have realized a few things and not value certain aspects as much as others do. But on the other side, it's daunting to criticize and get something wrong. Objectively, the build doesn't really match the price. It has a completely plastic enclosure, and that goes for the plate as well, with 99% of mechanical keyboards having a metal plate. It's also very light, but the plastic construction gives it a unique characteristic in how it feels and sounds when typing that many people do desire. These are using 45 gram Topra key switches. In my opinion, it's an acquired taste. Topra didn't amaze me at first, but over time I started to value it more, especially when using other keyboards with MX style switches. There were also a few issues with mine that I had to fix myself. The rattly spacebar on a Topra board just shouldn't exist. And then some keys had the weird sharp sound thing going on. And even though I was able to fix it to a degree, you shouldn't have to open up your keyboard to do that. There's definitely a protective feeling from the community for the HHKB. It's definitely not for everyone. For some, it's the perfect board. And I bet there's a fair few who just force themselves to like it because of the emotional and financial investment. But what we can say is that the Happy Hacking Keyboard is an important part of the community and is a clear representation of it as well. To start off with this perhaps may be a bit steep, but you can try. Thanks again to Danny for loaning this to me and I greatly appreciate it.